So I was very, very fortunate to have the great, great opportunity to spend, get to know this guy and uh, just be able to work together with him for, for such a long time. And then it's just so many wonderful experiments we've had together. He's part of our mastermind group. He, he arranged for us to have a, a great mastermind in Tokyo about a year ago, year and a half. It was really cool because his, his brother's over there and in the financial world over there, we got to do some pretty cool things and hang around, get sort of an insider view of Tokyo, which I just never forget and so thankful for him. But anyway, relative to what he, that practice was when he bought it, I think he's what are you, about 30 times bigger now or I don't know. It's like you're a hell of a lot bigger now and he's got two offices, just opened up another one and we're thinking about maybe opening up another one. So I just wanted you to welcome this guy's wealth of, Cedric Lewis' wealth of, wealth of knowledge. Please give him a warm welcome. Thanks so much, Cedric. <laughs> Thank you, John. Well, I'm the uh, last speaker of No Limits. So I want to congratulate you for all making it, and I'm glad I have more than half a room to talk to, so that always makes me a little excited. Uh, well, what I want to do first is I want to get, kind of lift the energy back up. I know you're all a little tired. Let's all stand up. Let's get the blood flow back in our bodies. I'll stand up, please. Indulge me, please. Stand up. So my manager at Wiley kind of taught me this exercise that I want to put you all through. Okay, I want you all to put your hands out. Okay, put them together. Out. Together. Faster. Thank you very much for that standing ovation. I'm not a good speaker as Declan, but at least I got a standing ovation, buddy. <laughs> I want to thank you all for showing up. I appreciate it. I think what I'm going to bring to uh, the table today is that you've heard so many great principles and logistics and the secrets of what you got to do. I'm not going to spend so much time with that as I am just going to be talking about kind of my story, how I got here, what I went through, the good, the bad, the ugly. I didn't steal that from Dr. Uh, Michelson, by the way. I had no idea he was going to do that. And all of a sudden, we kind of aligned it up. So I appreciate it. He's already kind of talked about some of the pain I went through as well. And I'd be glad to talk about that. But I'm amazed by that guy. He said, and literally in about two years, it's taken me many years to kind of go what he's done, and I'm just really impressed by that guy. So I'm looking forward to spending more time talking to that guy. Um, what I also want to do is I want to thank you all for um, giving me that standing ovation. So my team is out there, and we're from Hawaii, and one of the things we believe in Hawaii is spreading aloha. So we have some chocolate macadamia nuts for some of you. So I'm going to let them go out. They're going to be passing out. The ones who make the most noise, the most energy. We'll get those chocolates. So the more we hear from you, the better chance we have of getting some chocolates from us. I don't hear anyone. It's not enough chocolate. I think we have some chocolates here for you. <laughs> Plenty of chocolates. <laughs> so as they're passing it around, that's plenty of chocolates. Keep getting them. I'll let them pass it around for a bit. <laughs> so as they're passing it around, let me just tell you a little bit about me. Uh, yes, I'm the other guy in Hawaii. I'm also 10 minutes away from Dr. Devereaux's practice. We are competitors, I guess you could say. But uh, to be honest, we're, uh, we're the closest of friends. I consider him my best friend. And I'm very fortunate to spend time with him because uh, one of the things you're going to find, as every speaker has said today, it's easy, but it's not so easy. And when you're doing this kind of path, when you've chosen to do something like that, it's a very lonely road. And if not for talks and hikes that I go with Dr. Devereaux and Declan with, it's, it's literally, you can go down a rabbit hole pretty quick and get very, very, unfortunately, crazy. But to have friends, to have people who love you like Declan and I love each other, it makes it worth it. So thank you, Declan. Appreciate it, buddy. So what I do also want to do is I want to talk a little bit about us. I, I brought some team members that are passing out some candy. Are you guys done passing out candy yet? Can you guys come and join me, please? Here they are. Here they are. Thanks, you guys. Come on up. Come on up. So I think it's very important to understand. I think one of the things, and I'm sure every doctor here has mentioned that today, this thing, these things don't happen unless you have team members who believe in you, who support you, who hug you. Like, I've heard one doctor say, and I know Dr. Michelson said the fact that, you know, one of the things you have to be able to do in a situation like this 
is never let them see you sweat. And I, I agree to that to a certain extent, but I also have to admit, you have to have team members who will basically love you when you're vulnerable. And that's the one thing I've learned about this thing is that in times of crisis, in times of questioning what I can do, in times where I don't think I can do, I lean on these people. And these people get me through that. So I'm just so impressed by their ability, and I'm so impressed by their support. And if not for these wonderful people, I don't do what I do. So let me introduce these people. This is Josh. Josh is our uh, office manager at Wiley. Hello. Thank you. <laughs> we have Candice Lagamini. She's our office manager at General Carroll Pearl Ridge. I'll get to you last. This is Dr. Patel, Radhika Patel. She's one of our new doctors at Wiley. This is Marissa. She's our lead hygienist at Wiley. This is John Newman. John Newman is our human resource director. And I have one last person to introduce. So this is my, uh, this is someone's very special to me. Uh, this is my, my best friend, love of my life, my bride. This is my wife, Kristen. Yeah. Yeah. And the reason I have her up here is because I think we've all talked about how strong it is important to have a strong support in your life. I'll talk a little bit about what she's done for me, but without her, and I'm getting a little emotional myself. <laughs> Without her, I just, I, I really don't have a meaning, and I really think that everything that I've done and everything she's done for me makes it worth for me every single day of my life, and I thank you, honey. I love you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you, guys. I appreciate you coming up. <laughs> so let's get to uh, our story. So we are uh, Wildlife Dental Care and Dental Care of Pearl Ridge. Um, we're two practices, but uh, we have... Nine doctors uh, in my practice, nine associate doctors. I don't have any partners at this point. Um, I am out of the chair. I don't uh, see patients anymore. I do do exams on Saturday for one of my practices. And I'm doing that now to kind of, like a lot of you probably need to do with your own associates, spend time showing them how to do it. A lot of what we do is not just simply telling them what, but showing them why. And that's a big believer in my uh, particular organization where I think the leader needs to be out in front I think you need to show them how so they can believe in you and believe in what you're trying to do for your own vision. And so that's something I do in my own practice. Um, we are uh, essentially fairly decent size. Uh, my walleye practice has about nine chairs. We have four others plumb, so eventually we'll go to 13. And in my dental care porridge practice, we have 10 chairs. And I'm trying to get rid of that private office that my human resource director likes to use. <laughs> so I can put another chair in one of these days. <laughs> So a little bit about us. Um, what I want to do today is, I've, you know, I've, everyone spent so much time talking about the principles, logistics, and what works and how the systems go. So I think it's going to be beneficial for a lot of you, because I think a lot of you out there are probably thinking about, oh, how am I going to do this? I'm only a solo practitioner. I've only got three chairs. I don't even know how to get to point A to point B. How do I even go to that point? Even if I wanted to do that, how is it all going to work? So I think what I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk about my own story. If anything, I'm not so much here to give advice as I am to give experience sharing. Kind of show you what I did. Here's how I did the things that got us to a good point where we actually grow. But I think the most important thing I want to teach you guys is basically that I don't have all the answers. In fact, what you're going to learn today, you're going to see a lot of the mistakes I made. You're going to see the ugliness, kind of like the good, the bad, the ugly. You're going to see a lot of those things that I still deal with even today. What I'm hoping you guys get from these things is not so much, like I said before, the map to it, but kind of like what can be done how to deal with these things, and hopefully how to better your own organization. Okay? So let's see if I can figure this thing out. Did I do that right? There we go. So I'm just going to start how it all began for me. So I graduated for, from OHSU. It's a dental school in Oregon. It's in Portland. Great school. I did that in 1996. And when I got out of school, I didn't have any real connections or family members in dentistry or really friends. And I got a job with uh, a dental practice called Willamette Dental, big corporate dental practice in the Northwest. For those who live in the Northwest, I'm sure you guys know all about them. And they've got their rep, and they've got their bad you know, uh, PR about them. But what I enjoyed about that was that it gave me an opportunity to get really great opportunities in doing clinical dentistry. Because down in Roseburg, Oregon, it's, for those who don't know, it's a small, lumber-based town about three hours south of Portland. And there's not a lot of specialists around, at least when I was starting out there. And it just gave me an opportunity to really get a lot of confidence because I spent a lot of time really doing a lot of specialty services. So I got my confidence up to be a fairly strong clinician at a young point in my career. After doing that for about a year and a half, um, I'm a local boy. 
And uh, I really wanted to get back home. It was uh, important for me that I thought my future was there, and that's exactly what I wanted to do. And so in 1998, I moved back home. And so I took this picture to kind of show what downtown Honolulu looks like. A lot of you think Hawaii is like this palm trees and beaches. We're, we're a pretty big city, as you guys can tell. We're, I, mean, I think in Oahu alone, I think we're a million strong. I think 1.1 million, if I'm not mistaken. John, do you know that? About 1.1, I think. Any event, when I came home, at that time in my career, I had really thought, well, what I really want to be a part of, if I want to be a part of, like, you know what they talk about in dental school, they talk about the courses, like, being a part of an amazing cosmetic dental practice, being a part of a practice that's kind of for the elite. And I met these two older cosmetic dentists, and, and they're both kind of slowing down, and I thought, oh, great, what an opportunity for me to jump into that practice, be an associate, get great mentorship from these guys, and really go to the next level so I could become the next cosmetic guy in downtown Honolulu. So I thought. Well, anyhow, this is the dream practice, supposedly. This is for hours. They're open Monday through Thursday, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. They are fee for service. They didn't take any insurance at all. They are exclusive, providing the top level of clinical care on the island. And I thought, great, well, they're going to pay me 40% of collections. What a deal. I'm, sign me up. I was all in. So the reality, as many of you probably have found out about this, it was really a mirage. Um, I wasn't given any back office support or front office support for that matter. I was told I needed to find someone to uh, answer the phones. I needed someone to be an assistant for me. I uh, was not allowed to see any of their patients because I didn't have the clinical chops yet to be seeing their patients. And then when I talked about possibly doing my own marketing, I was told there's only kind of marketing we believe in is in-house. And if you're doing any marketing externally, that's the outhouse or the shitter. So it was a tough time. I mean, I thought to myself, well, how am I going to really get involved? I mean, get to the point where I was going to make this practice my own, and how I was going to be a great cosmetic dentist. And I just kind of, you know, believe it or not, it, it took me three years to figure that out. And the reality of doing this for three years and paying all that money for the CE courses that they told me I had to take and to become a certified COIS provider and to do all the things that are really great to learn clinically was I was left basically and I earned $21,000. That's how much I made. Yeah, it was bad. So I was at a point in my life where it was really kind of at a dark area. I mean, I, was, I, was, I remember being in my father's house and I was sitting in his office and I was sitting on a couch much like this. This was an old leather beat up couch he had. And I remember telling him, Dad, I, I, I'm not sure what to do. I don't, I don't, think, I can, I don't think I can make it. I don't, I don't think this thing's going to work out for me. And my dad, in his infinite sensitivity, kind of told me, well, you know, maybe you shouldn't be a dentist. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever considered law school? <laughs> this is a man who I asked him one day. We, you know, he turned uh, 80 recently. I had a nice dinner with him. I said, Dad, what's the, is there anything you regret? You know, I mean, I love you so much, and you've given me so much guidance, and you've been a great mentor for me. Is there one thing that you wish you did with me that you didn't do so far? And his point to me was, yeah, I wasn't hard enough on you. <laughs> I'm like, okay, that's, that's great. He's a great guy. I mean, he does, he's, he's, a, he's a Long Island Jew. So for any of those who, who are, uh, know how New Yorkers are, and if you're from Long Island and you're a Jewish guy like my dad, you, you kind of get it. <laughs> So it was at a point where it was really rough. I was at a point where I was obviously in a practice that wasn't working out for me. I was literally at the, my wit's end. And so I just went to survival mode, like many of you probably have done in your own lives before you start getting your own practice started. I started working for about three other doctors. I was doing all their emergency. I was taking care of their specialty services. I also took a job at a community health center, taking about $25 an hour, and literally working at about six and a half days a week just to make ends meet. I, I was, at this point, I was just trying to keep my head afloat. While I was doing these emergencies, as John was talking about, there was a doctor who actually had been with Chris Ad for a while. And he was uh, a guy from Bakersfield. And he had been in Hawaii for a few years, did not like Hawaii. I don't know why. But he, did, he was not happy in Hawaii. And he decided he wanted to move back. And we, we struck you know, a deal. It was just a point where it was like misery loves company. He was a guy who basically wanted to get out of his practice. I was a guy who wanted an opportunity. And we struck a deal for me to basically pay for the cost of his construction, his equipment, which went out to about $200,000. This is back in 2003. And fortunately, I was able to secure a loan with my dad co-signing. See, he did help me. <laughs> and we just basically jumped to it thinking like, OK, well, this is the greatest opportunity in the world. I'm going to go for it. 
And here are some realities. This is when I started out. <laughs> this is myself. This is my, uh, obviously my wife and my two dogs. And that was my family back then. And we had just started out. And the reality was kind of hit me in the face at that point. I realized, well, this is wonderful. I got my own practice now. But I only had, I had literally, it was a 900 square foot space. We had two chairs. We had one plumbed. And like I was telling you guys, the highest production until I took this thing over was $28,000. And I found out there was no active patient list. I literally, he had told me, I think I got about 300. Well, then I found that it was much less than that. I would say it was maybe 150 at the most at that particular time. No hygienist. I had two staff members <laughs> who, when I walked in, I still remember walking in with this, this day and meeting them. And the assistant at that time told me, I just want to know if you know what you're doing. Because the guy before you didn't, and I want to make sure you know what you're doing if I'm going to stick it around. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, yeah, I, I think I do. But so what I ended up doing is I just kind of started like a lot of us do. I just basically became, you know, an eight to five guy. I was working Monday through Friday, or we'd alternate and do, take a Thursday off and work a half day Saturday. And so I did that for several, oh, I wouldn't say several months. I think I did it for the first six months or so. Found out I was not making any money. I was really just basically, it was a tough time. I wasn't seeing many patients. I really didn't know what I was doing. I ended up going back to the community health clinic on Saturdays working just to keep, make sure I had enough money just to kind of pay the bills. At that point, I was literally working at that place to help make payroll literally every two weeks. It was tough, tough time for me. So I had these roadblocks. I, I had limited staff. I had limited space. I had no idea how to do what, what any business plan was. I had no marketing ideas what to do. And as I found out, one day I kind of was walking, because I had no patience, I was walking down in the parking lot of this place and I was looking at, oh, I wonder if there's other dentists here. I'm thinking at the time, maybe I need to just kind of associate one of these guys just to kind of keep my, my, you know, my practice at least funded so I could actually kind of pay the bills. And I remember looking <laughs> on the directory of this place I was working at. It was a professional building, about five stories tall, and another professional building next to it. And there were literally 60 other dentists in a one block radius. I was petrified. I had no clue how to run. I had no idea how to deal with this. So. <laughs> it's a tough time, man. I, I literally had no idea. I was just kind of freaking out, didn't know what to do. And I was sitting there at the, den at this, uh, at the practice I had bought. I was sitting in the private office. I was at a desk, and I was rummaging through the desk because I had plenty of time. So I'm rummaging through my desk, trying to clean up the, the office. And lo and behold, I find this old mailer that's sitting in the bottom of this desk, and it's from our friend John. And so I look at it, and I, and I end up calling the, uh, the previous dentist, and his, and his name is Steve. And I said, Steve, you've got this mailer down there, but does this stuff kind of work or not? And he's like, yeah, I, you know, it kind of works. I just wasn't into it, though, but yeah, I think it works. <laughs> so I thought to myself, well, he, if he wasn't into it, and, and I'm all in, maybe it'll work for me. So I, I, gave, you know, I gave them a call, and this guy shows up. <laughs> a lot younger back in those days, huh, Johnny? So he shows up, <laughs> and we go to dinner together. And um, as all of you who have met John, you know, first thing he tells me is like, "Oh, you know, you're going to do fantastic here. The guy before he didn't know what he was doing. He's not going to. You're, you're going to change this whole place around. You're going to light this place on fire." And I just remember thinking to myself, "I, I mean, here I am. I'm working at a community health center. I'm taking, looking for associate jobs just to kind of keep places afloat." And I'll never forget what he told me. And it still is something he continually tells me today. And I was at the point where he knew I was at my wit's end. And he said to me, he goes, said, he goes, I believe in you. And it's tough at those, in those moments of life when you're in kind of in a corner and when you have just someone telling you things to help you believe in yourself, it makes all the difference. And this guy made all the difference for me. And it was a big moment for me because then I said, if this guy believes in me, I'm just going to build for that momentum. And it is really that simple for me. And so I just said, okay, what's it going to take? What am I supposed to do? So the first thing this guy tells me, you know, oh, you've heard this before. A lot of this is repetitive. Open the flow. You know, hire some hygienists. Hire more support staff. Open more phone lines. All the stuff you've already heard many times at this conference. And when he was telling me all this stuff, I was nodding my head, smiling. But in my mind, I was thinking, what are you, what are you talking about? I just told you I don't have any money. I'm going to hire a staff member. What am I going to be doing? So. You know, just like people have talked before, at some point, you either make a decision to basically keep moving forward or you keep doing the same thing. And I didn't have the, the flexibility at, at that point to do the same thing. I had to do something. 
And so I did follow what John told me to do. I just kind of took a leap of faith, to be honest. I mean, with no money, I just did this thinking that, well, bringing these people on is going to make the money, so I'll be able to do this. And so, again, you go step by step. You don't, I mean, it's obviously a challenge. I'm not going to just jump in there at both feet. It, it took some time, but I hired another assistant. I hired a hygienist part-time. We did a little of a fresh start for myself. So this is a little bit later into the uh, chronology of the practice, but I hired an, a hygienist. I hired one associate part-time, and we just tied into, we basically took that third chair, and I plum, which is plumbed, and we put a, put a chair on it. And then later on, we put a fourth chair, because I got rid of my private office, and put a fourth chair. And then we started to grow. Things started to move in the right direction. So this gives you an indication of what we kind of did. So the first, you know, in 2003, it's myself, we had two chairs, one dock, and just by doing, and this is, again, this is all stuff you've seen many times before, so I'm, I apologize if it's repetitive, but it literally it's, just, it's this formula that really does work. So the reason I want to show you guys this before I get into the bigger picture is like, you're going to add chairs, you're going to add hygienists, you're going to add more doctors, and it will grow for you. And so we started to go really well, but by 2007, at my 900 square foot office, I had two docks, we were doing at that particular time, we had actually gone seven to seven, Monday through Friday, which we were doing at that particular time, like some of you are doing, is we did shift changes. I did seven to one, he did one to seven, and the following week we'd just switch up, and then we'd alternate Saturdays with each other. And it worked out pretty well, but by 2007, we started to kind of hit that proverbial ceiling. You know, we just really weren't getting any, anywhere, and we just had to grow to a certain extent. And at that particular time, I was just looking around, it was about 2007, so everyone know what happened in 2008, right? So in 2008, the economy tanks, Literally, overnight at the mall I was actually, my practice was in, I think, I want to say like close to, I would say, 30% of the tenants at Kahala Mall started to leave their, uh, their, uh, their spaces. All the real estate firms went belly up at one point, literally in, that, in, the, in the area I was working at. So there were about four different real estate offices that went belly up. And there's one large space in the bottom floor, street level, that a real estate company had left and it was about 2,000 square feet. And the landlord had told me, if you want to go in there, you can get in. And I thought to myself, well, you know, what the heck? I'm just going to keep following the actual formula. I'm going to go in there. We're going to put six chairs this time. And we're going to continue to grow. So what I did at that point is we just basically kind of followed the same formula. What did I do? I added more doctors, added more hygienists, added more team members. And we continued on that path. And we continued to grow. By 2014, we, we thought to ourselves, we had to find capacity in some other way of doing this, and so we thought to ourselves, we have to extend hours even further. We thought by 2014, we were already doing Saturdays, and the next thing that good old Uncle John tells me, he said, you gotta open Sundays. That's the only way it's gonna happen for you. So, at that point, I mean, whatever John told me I was gonna do, and that's kinda like the take home with you guys, to be honest, as much as you think he's crazy, I mean, this stuff works. There's just, just no doubt. I just, I can't, at this point, as much as I argue with him, and I still do, and I still run into the problems where I'm trying to figure out a better way, but it's really the only way to go. But 2014, we opened on Sundays. We hired two more associates, and by then, I was out of the chair. So 2014, I'd stopped practicing in the chair. I would jump in every once in a while to show the associates how to do certain procedures. I would get in there and do exams, but I was effectively, at that point, out of the actual rotation of doctors. So we continued to grow. We started to get to a point where things were going great. We ended up uh, adding more, uh, we had only six chairs, but we added more docks. We actually, at that point, had extended the hours on the uh, Saturday and Sunday. Uh, we were at eight to five. And we just continued to go on that same trend you're seeing right there. So about in 2014, we got to about, in that office, at about 3.7 million, I believe. And we're moving in a good direction at that point. But whatever, what seemed to happen to me is I started to feel the same thing that was happening in 2007 for us in the smaller office. We were hitting again that ceiling. And at that particular time, there was a rebound in the, in the economy at that point in Honolulu and I'm sure across the country where there wasn't any available spaces in my particular area anymore. But there was some growth going on in a neighborhood that's called IAEA, which is where my Dental Care Pro Ridge location is. And they were building onto a, 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 a actual mall and putting a big space there. At the time, Kaiser Permanente had an outpatient clinic, and they had decided not to build a pharmacy, which was going to be this 3,600 square foot space right next to them. And the people bidding for it were Starbucks and myself. <laughs> 
So if you've ever been in a negotiating table, no, I should say negotiating table. I would call it a bidding table with Starbucks. It can be a daunting phase. Now, what did I do? OK, so here's the secret. Get to like drinking whiskey with a developmenter. <laughs> <laughs> so what I did is I think a lot of you have to understand when you guys start looking at business, it really comes down to relationships. A lot of times you think it's like, well, I'm the small guy. I don't have a shot with this. It's all about the numbers. And yes, it's about the numbers. But a lot of it is relationship-based, and they leverage it based on who they think is going to be a great fit for their development. And that's what I did. I just spent time with the guy, told him what I had in mind, gave him my vision, told him what we had in plan. And he actually enjoyed it. This guy would come from a, you know, he was a small entrepreneur himself at some point, had grown, had grown into a huge uh, commercial developer and liked my story. And subsequently, I got in, I got into the space. We took the same space that Starbucks wanted. So this space is wonderful. It's literally at the entry point to the mall. It's got some of the best visibility on the block. And we got in. He did not give me a rent break. <laughs> this place, like, just like Declan's operation, this place caused me in rent, just for all, just so you feel, all of you feel immediately better. My rent for my new, and I'll show you the graphers. My rent for Pearl Ridge, $26,000. Per year, no, not per year, per month, per month, per month, sorry, per month. And people always ask me, is that the year? I'm like, no, 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 that, that's a month. And that's when I got, now, what, what is it now, Chris, it's about 30 now? It's $30,000 a month now. Kind of throws off those ratios, right? We have of what rent should cost when we're, when we're making stuff. So, long story short, at this point, this is advice, this is a little bit of advice I will tell you though. What we did in this case, when you go to your second practice, for those of you who want to do this and go to the second, how you're going to just get this practice to really start humming from the day one and really get to the point where you're growing exponentially quickly is what we did in, in this situation. Because I was already out of the chair at Wiley, I realized that I wanted to go there. A lot of franchises do this exact same thing. They go around, whenever they expand, they do multiple franchises, they take with them in these particular new places a SEAL Team 6 team. They go in there, they get their best people, they put them in there, they get the systems right, they know it's gonna be delivering, and we did exactly that. So this is a picture of the people who are with me. So this picture is like uh, myself, I was there, I had a pretty, pretty solid associate with me, I had two of my best assistants from uh, Wiley, and then right in front of me there to the, my left, or I should say my right, is uh, Drina. Drina is not here today. Drina is uh, one of my top people in my organization. She's my director of operations. Uh, probably the most amazing person I've met for someone as young as she is. She went to my, I'll talk a little bit about her because I think she's such a great individual. She joined my practice from the beauty industry when she was 19. She had no experience in dentistry. She started off as a receptionist, then she became a personal assistant of mine. When we opened up Pearl Ridge, she became an office manager there, and she helped me grow this thing. And at the age of 27, she's now responsible for operating and organizing an $8 million dental organization. 27. Amazing woman. Amazing. Amazing. So the good thing about this, this practice, and this is one thing I hope you take away, when you do that second practice, you're going to need strong people. You can't go there on a woman of prayer and just kind of input people. It's, it, yes, it's all about the growth, but it's also about the right kind of people in that growth. It doesn't just happen overnight. It doesn't happen to a point where you can just arbitrarily just put associates there or you can just put people. You need the right people to do those things. So again, we just kind of followed the same curve, and here's what we're doing. So in 2014, we opened up uh, Pearl Ridge. That first year, we did about, about $2 million, I think first year there. We continued to kind of grow, 2015, 2016, 2017. And you do notice that we're dipping there. And so I'm going to get to that in my presentation. We're dropping a bit. But there's some challenges we're running to. And I'm glad that that's where we're going to spend the most of my second part of my uh, presentation on. But I'm still proud of my guys. My, I mean, you know, we, and we're not, uh, we don't have Dr. Michelson's ability <laughs> to do that in two years. But we have, in our in amount of time, constantly been moving up. So we're at a point, our, our zenith, we're at about 8 point, I believe, 2. Now we're about, uh, we had a drop. We're at about 7.6. We did drop you know, a lot, but there's some reasons that I'll talk about, and a lot of it's my fault. And I'll talk a lot about that. Okay? So, you know, in our minds, we thought things were booming. You know, th and it, you know we're doing well. You know, we're, we're excited about our growth. We think things are going really well. But 
as I found out pretty quickly, you know, we, <laughs> things weren't that great. <laughs> so when you look back at that graph, let me see if I can go back on this one here. Yes, let me go back to that graph. So what's going on? If you look at this graph closely, you might notice in 2014 when we opened up Pro Ridge and I left, even though I wasn't in the chair, do you see how it kind of drops there for Wileye? Wileye starts to drop. Wileye's dropping bad. And because of my own ego and focus on the growth of the entire organization, I, w I had my eye off the ball. I wasn't watching that. And that's exactly what caused some issues. Now, we spiked up in 2017, but I'll tell you why that happened in a moment here. But there was a problem. For three years, we were, we were diminishing our, our growth at Wileye. So like I said, even though I thought things were booming, they're not. In fact, what was happening at Wildlife Dental Care is it was the Lord of the Flies, and I, and I use that term <laughs> not loosely. It got kind of nutty there. I literally had associates calling me and telling them I was treating them like a red, <laughs> red-headed stepchild. I was told I'd lost touch with them. I had reports of them, of, a, of hygienists standing in front of the office and telling them the real reason Dr. Lewis is doing this is just because he's making more money. He's gonna start cutting your wages soon. This is the wrong place to be. This is a crappy office. We need to think about going someplace different. So in 2016, there was a lot of turmoil. In fact, what ended up happening is most of my associates, management and hygienists, exited the practice at Wildlife Dental Care. It was literally a start over. I mean, it was to the point where I lost, I think in one, in a two month period, we lost three associates and then we lost the other one right after that. And so I got into scrambling mode. I had to kind of rebuild this whole thing and I want to admit the fact that it was the reason we had all that problem, it was me. It was me. I mean, uh, it was my leadership. And it was a point where I was focused on the growth. I was focused on an ego-based leadership skill set. I was based on why can't you do what I'm doing kind of a mindset. And it kind of filtered down at the point. It filtered down to my managers. My managers were kind of seeing what I valued and that became how they were dispensing their communication to their team. And so it wasn't any surprise that this kind of thing happened. We really became a crisis management team rather than one of a mission and vision. And we realized at that point things were just kind of in a big, you know, it was kind of a, it was a tough time for me. It was, it was rough because it was literally that kind of sink or swim moment all over again. You know, I thought things were pretty bad once at the beginning of my career, but here's a whole new different kind of problem to deal with. So in 2017 and 2018, because I had literally, you know, I had one associate left, I believe, I had to get back in there. So I got back in there, we slowly built the team back up, we hired some more associates, and it was good. I mean, it was, it was as much as it was painful, it really allowed me to see the practice from an associate doctor and staff perspective again. Because one of the things I kind of lost sight of is how important people are and how important the team is in your growth. And that's a big thing I want to save you all from. The trappings of growth can be a very blinding effect to you. Growth is great, but unless you have your eye on your people and why you did it, things can unravel very quickly. And that's exactly what happened to me. The great news again, however, is I got to be back on track with my team. I was able to observe interpersonal interactions. I was able to infuse customer service again. My managers and I were able to see firsthand what was not working, where the poison was in the, in the organization. And it really did have, it had me get to a point where I had to really reevaluate re our entire team. And it got to a point where we were suddenly able to kind of restart, there was that restart button again. And I started to realize at that point, I had to get out of this perception that I had it all figured out. I mean, that was the one problem I had back in those days, which is I really thought, in 2017, until this all thing started to unravel on me, that I had all the answers, or at least I'd figure it out eventually. And it got to the point where it humbled me to a point where I had to realize I no longer could be an answer man. I'm sorry, an answer man. I had to develop, or I had to, with my team, we had to develop a way that we could actually create an organization where everyone felt they were a part of it. So it grew in a way where everyone started winning rather than just the perception where I was going to win. So it gave me a chance to finally start taking some accountability again, and that was my biggest you know, foible at the time. I kind of got too full of myself, and I admit that. It was, it, was a, it, was, it was my fault. So what we ended up doing is Drina and I and my leadership team started to get a lot more focused. 
You know, I started to re-engage with the associate dental mindset. A lot of times, until then, my meetings with my associates had been basically looking at their reports, looking at their production per hour, driving their, their performance, and asking them why they weren't at this number. And I think back about that now, what a jerk. I mean, I mean, when we're talking about helping associates out, when you're talking about helping these doctors out, it really, you really have to take to a point where you no longer can be so focused on performance. It really has to be about, are you really helping and improve? Are you serving them better? Are you really kind of creating a, an environment, a culture, that makes them feel like they're a part of something so they do want to perform better? But if you don't have that type of mindset where you're personally interested in them and improving them, they know that. They read that. Your team reads all that. So you really have to start looking at these things differently, and that's exactly what I started to do. So fortunately, as you guys have seen since in the beginning of, this, of today, we, I have a bunch of guys I hang out with who are in the, you know, that we're calling ourselves the Next Level Academy. Um, and the great thing about having guys like this in my life is that it gave me the opportunity to talk to these guys. What's working for them? You know, like Declan talked about, he's in an office, or his office at a point where he's getting people in his office to vote his business as being the best place in the home to work in. I was talking to, to Justin, Justin talking about his culture and how his team feels aligned and how they actually really care about one another. And I started to kind of you know, read the writing on the wall. Here I was looking at my business as just a numbers game, when in actuality, it's really a people game. And that's how we started, really started looking at my practice differently. So we started looking at everything differently. We started looking at on, our onboarding for doctors. We started looking at a structure of our office. We started looking at creating not just ways of creating a better culture, but creating an expectation in the practice where everyone kind of knew their roles and we knew what we were supposed to do. They felt comfortable. We gave more stability. And so a lot of it was just kind of getting ourselves organized again and communicating again so people knew exactly what was expected from them. So one of the things I think Chris had wanted me to talk about today, and I'm happy to talk about it, is literally that gap between ownership and associate doctor's expectations. And it really comes down to your ability to understand the associate doctor mindset. What I started to find out, what I found a common thread when I talked to a lot of my docs, is that there's these four different items, and obviously there's different ones per individual, but these are things I would all of you like to take into account when you're talking to your associate doctors and making sure you understand these things. You know, things for our associate doctors, a lot of us think, oh, they're so lucky, they've got all these patients we put in front of them, you know, why don't they understand what a great opportunity they have? And we sit there and we, you know, I, I remember having talks with one of my buddies in their practices and like, we, we get so upset and we just like have these war stories of how terrible our associates were. And I mean, and then I started to realize, what, what am I doing? I mean, this is exactly what got me into the same, you know, nightmare I had before. And so what I do now is I started to kind of figure out what I try to do now is I look at what they look at and what they actually take into account when they're in a practice. And most of them feel pretty, highly pressured because they see, they, they're not dumb, they know they're in a practice which is you know, fairly busy and booming and growing and they feel like they want to contribute but they also feel highly pressured and they feel like their expectations are through the roof and they don't know how to reach those. So rather than me kind of coming into meetings with them and simply tell them what you need to do, I ask a lot of questions now. And I mean what I oftentimes ask them is what can I do to help you? you know, how can we, what can we do about this? so that they understand that I'm not in there to kind of basically just make them feel like, you know, they're not good enough, but more importantly, listen and hear from them what they're trying to accomplish, and so that I can understand their issues, and at that point, be a better coach. And that's the whole thing, being a better coach. A lot of times, you know, they're gonna feel misunderstood. They, they oftentimes feel, I've heard the word interrogated, intimidated. At one point, there was a joke in the office that it was like the Darth Vader theme would, would be on whenever I'd walk down the hall. You know, here he comes, Darth Vader comes down the hall, a short Darth Vader, but it's still Darth Vader. <laughs> but um, it got to a point where I realized that vibe I was giving off was, was causing this misunderstanding. Here's another big thing for docs. They are tired of being micromanaged. Associate doctors, they're bright people, they really are. And sometimes we diminish them because they're not on the same level of understanding, or well, they're not as clear on their objectives as the ownership doc or the owner doctor is, but it doesn't help if you're in their grill on a constant basis. It doesn't help their performance by making it even more difficult for them. And the last thing is that, and this is something that we have to be very careful about, this is a team and a management type of thing we have to work on, 
is that they're oftentimes feeling like we're causing instability. Like if they're seeing turnover, if they're seeing things not feeling comfortable in the practice, if they're seeing that level of kind of that kind of malaise kind of culture that goes on, they feel like you caused that. And so what I think, what I'm trying to do now, and we're working a lot in my management team to get better about this, is we're trying to create stability. We're trying to be a better management team. We're trying to talk to people. We're trying to be a better place to work. And we haven't got it figured out better. What we're getting to now is we're starting to develop, as if something happens in any larger organization, and I heard some doctors talking about before, is you really start to develop some really strong culture by having good core values, and that's what we're starting to do now. And one of our big things we've done now is to create our core values. And we've always had this, but we've never done a good job of really kind of putting it on a poster or putting it in the office where everyone knows exactly what you stand for. And more importantly, they understand that every decision you make, everything you do in terms of how you deal with things are going to be based on these core values. And we have a mission statement, but what I'm always kind of talking to my team about is the core value, which in our practice is serve people better. And that's just not something for your patients. And here's the critical component. It's about each other and your team, because if you can't take care of one another, how do you expect them to take care of your patients? And so we're big on that. We're big on trying to make sure that everyone understands that we have to take care of one another better. We have to do a better job of taking care and serving one another. And if you have that culture, doing the customer service, doing the things that serve patients better becomes a natural byproduct of, their, of how they actually have their belief system at that point. So a lot of the things, if you guys want to know, how do you go about at the larger operation? How, and I'm, so this is something that Justin, I'm certain, does. I know Declan does these things. I know all the guys who've got larger operations. You have to be involved. You've heard this time and time again about building better systems. Again, you don't want to make it all about the systems, but you certainly have to have that in place so your people know the expectations. They know the understand how you're going to operate. And so here's a few of those things. I'm big on practice manuals. I'm big on standard operating procedures. I'm, and the reason being, as someone mentioned before, you, can't, you really can't depend on superstars. It's a dangerous thing to do. Many of you have had people in your practice for several years, and I hope they stay forever. But sometimes they leave, and not because they don't like you. There's a life change. They move out of town. They move out of state, or they just simply aren't quite the right fix anymore. You need to be ready by doing these practice manuals and operational manuals so you're not going to be left in the dust. We have uh, a lot of people, looks like these guys, I don't want to go through all these. These are things they've talked about all day, but we have some of the same kind of systems in our own practice. One thing I think that we did, this is what I thought was an interesting thing we're doing now. A lot of times in some of your practices when you have associate doctors or many associate doctors, a lot of you have managing doctors in your practice or owner doctors who do all the onboarding. And I used to do all that. I, I, I kind of, you know, one thing I used to, I didn't bring this up, but I used to actually teach at uh, that, that community health center. There was a residency program, so I used to do a lot of teaching there for some of the residents who were there. And so I kind of love coaching. I like teaching. But I found when I did it in my own practice as the owner doctor, I was highly ineffective because these, the associate doctors would only really tell me what I wanted to hear. When I would ask questions, they would oftentimes give me things that I think they're probably telling me so I get off their back, to be honest. And I found out, in order for us to be better, what really worked out well is Drina, my director of operations, will oftentimes have regular meetings with them, with weekly meetings. Dr. Patel, how often does Drina meet with you? Is it weekly now or weekly? And what she's oftentimes doing is she's looking at our reports with the doctor. It's not me anymore. I'm not the one looking at numbers with the doctors. She's looking at the same reports that Justin talks about, that a lot of our doctors have brought up, that Declan does. And she is the one going over the numbers with them. And she's asking questions. She's asking them at what areas they need help in. And so what happens is she's developing a culture that makes them feel as if they can be more honest, more open, more vulnerable with her, and tell them their problems. So what she does then is she tees them up for me. She identifies, oh, so Dr. So-and-so has a challenge getting crown preps done. It's taking him an hour and a half. We want to get him to an hour. How do we do that? And she'll ask the doctor these things. And the doctor will kind of explain some of his impediments or his roadblocks. But at least now when I meet with them, I have a clear objective what to talk to them about. Rather than me sitting there and trying to ask 20 questions and play that awkward stare game at each other, <laughs> it now becomes something very productive for that meeting. Okay? So along our lines, what we typically do is we have, um, obviously, with Dr. the same thing you guys are probably doing with those of you who have associates. We're obviously having them sign a, con like sign a contract, insurance credentialing, all the paperwork that goes into that. But the first thing they do, rather than meeting with me, is they meet with... Typically, Drina, sometimes we're office managers, and we're explaining 
the core values. We're kind of going over office policy. We're giving them expectation. And we're more importantly giving them the hierarchy of the practice so they know who to go to. A lot of times when the associate doctor enters your practice, they feel very lost, nervous, because they really don't know who to be interacting with. Because they're going to have a lot of questions. That's just, you know, normally when a new doctor comes in, they don't know how to function. They want to know how we do things. What's our philosophy? Who do I go about these things? Who do I talk to about this certain stuff? Now you're already covering those things. But it's not me doing it, because I don't know for, for that matter. But now they know exactly what goes on. The next thing we do is we've created a calibration system in our office. Declan taught me this. We get the doctors together, and we've actually, before they even come in, we've already kind of calibrated the doctor team on how we're diagnosing. So that we're not going as a general rule of giving people $30,000 treatment plans. We're kind of staying in the same thing you heard from Dr. Bickling. We're already covering that stuff ahead of the game so they know that's our philosophy before they even see a patient in our practice. And that's helped out immensely from creating you know, a lot better trust uh, communication and trust uh, relations with our patients now. And then the other thing we're also doing is we're also providing them in that same calibration method, we're also providing them expectations on professionalism, doctors, and how they actually interact with our team, how they carry themselves, so they understand from the very beginning what their expectations are, not just clinically, but as leaders in the organization. So one thing John taught me is that, uh, and we do this in our practice, we have a hierarchy chart. That's not everyone. We've actually grown since that photos were taken. We've got about, like I said before, close to 60 people. But it allows our doctors, our team, to understand who everyone is, more importantly, who they're going to be interacting with, and more importantly, who they go to with certain questions or needs they may have. So this is something that Drina put together. And I wish Drina could be here, because this is what she was going to be talking about today. But she, we have really defined roles and responsibilities for everyone in leadership. Again, I'm not going to go through all this, but you have all in front of you there. But now, everyone in our organization knows who to go to, who to report to. If they have issues, questions, input, these are the kind of people they're going to have to talk to. So again, I'm not going to go through all these things. Meetings. Have any of you read the book Traction? Great book. It's by Gino Traction. It's, just, it's basically, it really talks about like a recipe book of how to organize your business, but we use it primarily for our meeting structure. Meetings used to be in my office, a crisis management uh, yelling session, and it was a lot of moaning and groaning, and what are we going to do? The sky is falling, but I'm not sure what to do, and we talk about something that wasn't working. But this has really been transformative for us. It really kind of puts things in an organized fashion so we know exactly how to do these meetings. We keep on time. We have ways of keeping things updated. We're not going to get to a point off. In fact, in this practice, in this kind of meeting structure, we have a set moderator, a set timekeeper, and we have some person who is called tangent alert. So when people get off base, someone yells out, tangent alert, we get back on target. Okay? Stats, again, a lot of this is repetitive. This is kind of, we have dashboards. We have dashboards like all of you probably have. What we think we do that I really like about it is we put this on a Google Drive so our doctors and our team members and our managers can see it at any time of the day. They just go to their phones, they pull up their Google Drive, and they see exactly how the practice, or at least the doctors, are performing in these particular measurements we do. I think that's great because now that there's nothing, it's all transparent, there's nothing to hide. Doctors know where they're at, they know how, in fact, this is great because now doctors now see where they're challenged or are doing well at, and they know exactly how to drive their performance a little better now. So that's structured meetings, hygiene capacity. So let me talk a little bit about what we learned. So as you guys saw in that, that graph, one of the biggest challenges we have now is not understanding hygiene capacity. This is what I want to talk about. In that graph you saw when I was talking about things flattening out, one thing you could have said, oh, well, it's because you left, you left Wyla. That's why it happened. <laughs> Maybe. But I think what happened in talking to Josh Blount and talking to the Chris Ad team when I went there a couple weeks ago, it was really because we really never opened capacity. We were more focused about hygiene being jam-packed, and we do all the right things, we try to at least, of trying to make sure they're putting things in prime time, trying to make sure weekends are first. But what we lost sight of is thinking to ourselves, well, we don't want to hire more hygienists because we won't be able to get that hygienist filled up for quick enough. And we started to look at it really closely, and we started to realize it's really about occupancy rates. So like someone told me, I think it was Dr. Bickling had said, once we start looking at our practice closely, and we see our hygiene get to about 65% filled, immediately we're hiring another hygienist now. 
So we've got 12 hydrogens now. We literally, just as a, a, an experiment since that meeting in, in Chrisat, we put a third hygienist now on both Saturdays and Sundays now. So we've, we have six lanes of hygiene running and one phantom lane. And within two weeks, we had a third, third hygienist filled. And I mean, it wasn't because we did anything different. It just, it just happens because we're finally opening up capacity again. So I'm a big believer that's going to start really growing our business and our practice again because we're finally starting to listen to what I've been, been doing and not been doing in a while is kicking my eye off the ball and not looking at how things actually trend in the practice. So the new beginnings for us is like, you know, things, you've heard this again and again, I don't want to get too repetitive, but even at my stage where I think we've done pretty well and grown, we still have to do the same things that everyone else is saying. It's, whether you're small, whether you're large, you have to constantly keep your eye on these kind of things. So our new beginning is probably what many of you are going to do when you get back to your own practice on Monday, hire more hygienists. It, hire more doctors. You know? And then we just heard this earlier, focus our treatment presentation on communicating patients' need rather than promoting or emphasizing insurance coverage or terms or emphasizing real high cost things because we think that's what they want. You know? Refocusing our hygiene pre-appointment scheduling to only the power hours. One of the biggest problems we did was we weren't Listening to that, we kind of thought to ourselves, let's just fill the, uh, the hygiene, that'll make it all work out for us. So again, I'm not gonna run through all these things, but I wanted to make sure you understand what, uh, what I run into. So I put this up here. Many of you might be thinking, God, that sounds terrible. Why would you ever want to do what he's talking about? It sounds like there's always stress, there's always turmoil. You gotta do all these things, you gotta go into all these meetings, you gotta spend time, spending so much time worrying about things, it seems like chaos. But doesn't, it's being a solo practice owner, I gotta be, <laughs> and some of you may disagree, and I respect that, but this is what's going on. I mean, for those who are solo practitioners, and you get this, and I respect the heck out of you guys because you wear so many hats. I mean, you guys are first in line in contact for everything. What toilet paper do you want, Doc? <laughs> what? That's happening all the time. You're working in your business rather than on the business. That's the biggest challenge I think that happens. You're the guy making magic happen in the chair. You're the game show host in the, uh, in the hygiene exams. You're the phenomenal clinician in the, in the restorative chair. Who's watching the business? And if you are that doctor who's a rare doctor who's actually really successful at doing that, you're doing 20 extra hours a week making that happen for yourself. Am I right? You solo guys are working your asses off, which I respect, that's a great thing to do, but that's when I give you perspective. As much as you think it's difficult and hard what we do, it is. My focus is on the business. My focus is on my team. My focus is on my doctor's improvement. I'm affecting change in the business because I can be nimble and do those things. You can't do that because you're so focused on just getting things taken care of. You're putting out the fires every single day. It's hard to do what you guys do. And here's the other reality. As Dr. Devereaux was saying, the cost, your rent, your supplies, everything is going up, but your reimbursement rate is getting lower, and it's gonna get even lower. Physical mental breakdown, we all get that. At the end, I put this funny thing, you know, you, you have to be an expert in all business-related activities in your office. HR director, payroll benefits specialist, executive sales manager, marketing director, bookkeeping auditor, and it goes longer and longer and longer because you are everything. It's tough, I mean, I, that's why I look at it. So I put this here to give you perspective. The reason I can't, I don't even have the choice to become a solo practitioner yet. I don't have that choice physically anymore. I've had two back surgeries. I'm the statistic that John talks about to you guys. In 2015, I had one, didn't go well. I had a second one in 2017. So I don't have the opportunity or for that matter, the ability to go back in the chair. I can go in there and do light work, but I really can't do it anymore. So when those things ever happen to you, you have to have another option. You have to think along these lines because you're gonna probably not be available to deal with this unless you're properly prepared. And so that's why I think this is such a great model to think about doing for yourselves. Here's another reality. This is the state of the dental industry, guys. I just read this in the Bureau of Labor Statistics recently. So at, the, at its peak, and then recently as 2011, the average solo doc made about $190,000. That's great. But today, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, in April of 2018, that figure now is 158K. Things are dropping. Things are dropping. In fact, it made the comment, income for the solo practitioner continues to go down in an average of 5K per year. And the reason, like I said, just is happening to you, costs are going up, reimbursements are going low, it's gonna keep happening. Corporate dental is now 12 to 14% of our market. 
They're growing 20% a year. Solar practices, they have grown less than 3%. Insurance companies, this is what I got from John. Insurance companies are now opening and funding more of the, oh, their own dental practices. Western Pacific, Bright, Bright Now, Aspen, there's insurance money behind that. In fact, Western Dental was also called Cigna Dental in Arizona and California until 1988. It's already happening. Insurance companies are now literally opening their dental practices and controlling the economy when it comes to us. Other things, solo dental practices. Overhead, 15 years ago, 10 to 15, 50%. Now, 70% plus. I mean, the writing's on the wall. So when it comes down to things that I'm always trying to impart is a little bit of wisdom. And a lot of us, again, experience sharing. I'm not telling you what to do. I'm not telling you how to run your business, but this is something I've learned in going through my story. As you've heard before, what I'm telling you to do or consider to do and actually go in this direction, it's not gonna be easy. As you've learned in my own story, it can be very hard, it can be very painful, but the concepts, that's the great thing I think it's so wonderful about Chris and John and his team, they've, they're giving you the formula. You don't have to make it up anymore. You don't have to read a ton of books. You don't have to do all this mental gymnastics. You've got the formula. Do what they say, it will work, okay? Other things, like Dr. Uh, Michelson was saying, and I get this, you know, he did this in two years, so I'm amazed how great he's done. But like he said, there's gonna be turnover, and it's not because you're terrible. Now, in my case, I was, I admit that. That was that, that was the problem there, okay? But a lot of times, they're going to leave simply because it's just not in their makeup. They're just, they're don't, they don't want to evolve with the practice growth, and that's okay. They can move on, and they'll probably be happier somewhere else, and you'll probably be happier. You're going to fail. Get used to it. Failure is not a bad thing. I know that's such a, that's as dentists, we're so risk averse. We're so worried about talking about our failures, our problems, what we do wrong. Get over that. The only way you're really gonna develop and get better is failing and failing a lot. You're gonna get better, you're gonna get stronger. It's something you're gonna have to actually process and get good at. Success is a lousy teacher, so be humble and grateful when it happens. And this is one thing I'm always telling my team. When we do the right things again, things go right. We've had a successful trend in the past, but when it does happen, let's not get full of ourselves. We have to constantly stay humble, appreciate one another, serve each other really well. Create that standard operating procedure. Manage by stats. And this is a big thing with your management team in particular. Always stick with statistics and numbers when you guys are talking about your business. Do not do hunches and emotion. That's the quickest way to financial ruin. Hunches and, hunches and emotions will get you killed every single time. Other big thing is we try to do now, and this is one thing I'm working on a lot better, and I think we're getting better as a team, mission-driven principles that govern all actions and decisions of the organization, making sure that everyone understands where you're going and everyone feels a part of the growth. Trust your people, but please verify. Okay, important to do these things. My guys always know this. I trust them implicitly. My managers are amazing, but they always know that I'm, the first question I'm gonna ask them is, okay, where's the numbers? Let me see them. Because I believe in them, but I wanna make sure the statistical proof of it. So for those of you who are considering doing these kind of things, this is the kind of mindset you have to start to think about for yourselves. You've gotta become businessmen. I know that sounds terrible. Some of us in the industry think, oh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm a dentist, I'm not a businessman. You are, you own a business. Otherwise, you're just working in a job. Get comfortable being a business owner, okay? Develop leadership skills, read books, be around other leaders, spend time around people who own, not just dental practices, but successful businesses in your local community. One of the things that I did that really helped me in my growth and getting my mind right was I was involved with a group called EO. Does anyone know who EO is? Have you heard of it before? Entrepreneur's Organization? No? Okay. It's the, it's the same guy who wrote the book Scaling Up. Vern Harnish, has heard of that book before? So uh, what the whole thing was, and I'd encourage you guys to do things like this, is to create a group of people that you have similar types of businesses like yourself. It could be dentistry, it could be medicine, it could be you know, franchises for you know, a bunch of fast food restaurants. Ultimately, they're gonna have very similar issues that you would have. As, as much as you think you have a very unique business, they got the same issues. Payroll, they got business growth, they got turnover, they got expansion issues just like you do, and it's great to have time to spend time around these guys to get your mind right. I put a 10 next level. I, it's a shameless plug, obviously, but uh, the, the idea of this is something that I really believe strongly in. One of these, uh, this thing for me 
is probably the most important. Next to my family, I really look at these guys as my brothers and sister. Tiffany, where's Tiffany at? Not here. But these are the people who provide me my safety net for me. They provide me the chance to think outside the box. They provide me a chance to, to listen to me. But most important to me is they give me the ugly truth. If I get off the rails, these are the guys who talk me off and get me back on track. I'd encourage you, if you can do the same thing for yourselves, if you lo I'd love you guys to spend time with us eventually when this thing starts up. But one of the things I'm going to be teaching, at least in my section, is how you can do that in your own community so you actually can create your own mastermind. And that's going to be powerful stuff for you. Okay? Read business books. If you don't like reading, get over that. Read them. Read. I don't see the problem. Just read. Like, like, you know, just like Justin does. Get audible. I read two a month. If I'm not reading two a month, my, my, my team will see this. I'll walk in with a book and throw it in front of them. I want you guys to read this one. And I usually walk with new books every week, and I just am pissed off, but I still do it because I just want to help these guys. <laughs> Mentorship skills. Find a mentor or learn how to be one, too. This is an important thing that I want to make sure I, I'm, I really am clear about. Finding a mentor does not mean you walk up to someone and say, I want you to be my mentor. Okay? Finding a mentor means finding people that challenge you, finding someone who's actually another level than you're at, spending time with them. Take that guy out to dinner. Take that gal out to dinner. Make sure you do everything you can to learn and be molded because the ones who have really done well for themselves, but think about John Christensen. If you really want to do, he doesn't have to spend as much time talking to all of us. He doesn't really, he could sell the company. But what drives him is affecting people's lives and being mentor. And he doesn't look at it as being a burden. For him, it's his driving force. That's what keeps him moving every single day of his life. Right, John? He's not here? It's okay. <laughs> but what I learned from that is that in that process of finding your mentors, you need to become one too. From a leadership standpoint, if you truly want to start affecting change in your company, you have to be one to mentor. It isn't about just driving numbers. It isn't about just driving growth. You need to be the person who's taking care of your people and mentoring them so you can improve their lives and improve their performance. But you've got to be willing to do that. You can't step away from that. I, that's one thing about the Bahamas thing that I, I understand the concept. But for me, my position now is being a better coach, a better mentor for my people, because that's how the organization improves as, as, a, as an entire growth industry. So here's another big thing I'm always telling you know, my team. You have to be focused, or at least I do, or any of you people out there who are going to be mentors or actually going to be a great uh, leader for your organization, your focus now has to be in building an amazing team rather than rebuilding a tooth. For so long, we, you know, it's a, it's a hard switch. I mean, one of the big things that I had to get out of my own head was thinking to myself, I just can do it better than a associate. I'll just jump in there and just you know, do the procedure better because I'm better at rebuilding or doing dentistry for that. that but what I should be focusing on if you really want this to grow, you need to be focusing on making a better team so they get better at doing the job for you. And that has to be the big mental switch you're going to have to make if you want this to work for yourself. I put a couple books here. Here's ones that I've always liked. Many of you have probably seen these books. This is a couple. There's many more out there. I, I love the E-Myth. That's kind of what got me, at least from a book standpoint, on the path of like thinking of uh, my practice as more a business. It's a great book for those who just want to get the mindset right. Uh, the Four Disciplines of Execution, I think that's a great book as well. That's just a great thing for your management team to read. It's a great book in helping your team understand how they can execute. Because one of the biggest things you guys all do to your team, you give them a litany of projects, but you have no way of understanding when they're going to fix those projects. This will actually get your team to actually start looking at things and getting things done on a timely basis. Next Level Academy, again, all of you probably at this point know what that's about. Lastly, I just wanted to, you know, one thing that's important for me is that um, you know, there has to be a why. We've always heard people talk about how important it is and, and their family is the driving force, which for me it is, and that's my wife and my son, Cole. He's age 11. Love that guy. But what really makes me get up in the morning, what really drives me is that I really have got to the point, I've, I'm really, you know, learned that unless I really take a general, I shouldn't say general, but a very, very focused interest on really improving the lives of my team, it's never gonna happen for you. So I look at it at a point, what gets me up in the morning, and this sounds kind of contrived and somewhat kind of silly, but to be honest, it really drives me in the morning. I get up at three o'clock in the morning every day. That's just kind of my routine. I get up, I read a little bit, I focus on what my goals will be. But I oftentimes think about my, my team because I oftentimes think to myself like, man, if it wasn't for these folks, none of this stuff happens. I need to be a better leader, I need to be a better person. 
So I just want to show a couple of my team members. We've got, that's not all 60 of them, obviously, but those are some great you know, photos of my team, and I just feel very strong about how much I can do to serve them better. So again, here's one thing I wrote, and I wrote this down for my team. The oftentimes, or anyone who wants to basically listen or read that, I oftentimes hear a lot when people are asking me, like, well, what, what's the one thing? What are you doing that's allowing you to kind of do these things? How do you get your head right? How do you be a better leader? And I'm saying the same thing I'm telling you know, most of my friends and anyone out there who listen to me, it really comes down to your resilience and perseverance and your tolerance of failure. I mean, I've just got used to failing a lot, to be honest. I, I really think it comes down to your ability to just keep moving forward and understanding things are gonna continually become challenging and just not to get dissuaded by that. I mean, it's just, if you want to grow, if you want to do better, you have to get a little more bulletproof. And that's just what it comes down to. So I'm gonna end here by saying this is our big motto, serve people better. I hope you do the same for your people. I wish you all success, prosperity, and most importantly, love. Thank you for your time. Okay. And I'm told that we have about 10 minutes for questions. For anybody have questions for anybody who's here, me or anyone, uh, we're right here, man. So any questions from anyone? What's the, what's, what did you learn that was the most, oh yeah, sure, Brandon. You may have to yell it. Okay. Good microphone. Microphone, please. Hello. Hey. Thank you, John. Great conference. Really enjoyed thanks, it. Thanks a lot, Brandon, for coming. Well, one thing I really struggle with is, um, and we heard an answer from Justin about how he dissuades patients from scheduling treatment on Saturdays. Yeah. Uh, I just have a lot of trouble with that in my office for some yeah. reason. Like, even if I give a response like that to the patient, the patient's still like, I gotta have Saturday, I work. And so what I've been thinking about doing is having one Saturday per month or one weekend day per month that we're just gonna do all restorative and that'll be the exception. Now, uh, I, I have no, no problem with that, but except for the fact that you're sometimes gonna make somebody wait four, four weeks for something that's really super urgent, you know? And, so, and that's going to be the hook, is you don't yeah. want to have to wait four weeks or eight weeks, so let's get it done on Tuesday at 9 a.m. Or maybe partition out a quarter of a day on a Saturday for only restorative. But, yeah. the, I mean, I, I'm, I, can, I can't document what's supposed to be done and is it really being done. And I can just tell you what Nybauer told me at, on this question. And I asked him multiple times, and he doesn't keep stats on it, how many people don't come back on Tuesday when you tell them to come back on Tuesday? He said, never do they ever not come back. And never do they go on, they want it the Saturdays. Now, maybe this is somebody's memory not working as good as reality. I'm not sure. But, but if you say, you got to get this done right away. Dr. Smith will, will, will do this on Tuesday at 2 o'clock. Don't miss appointment or you're going to die. Whatever. That, that apparently, and I can't be there to to verify, I'm told by many, many people that if you don't give them the option of the Saturdays, they actually won't ask for the Saturdays. So make sure they're not offering the Saturdays or offering, saying to them, when do you want to come back? Does that make sense? This is what I'm told though, Brandon. It, it so, does make sense. Yeah. And, and that's my worry. If I do offer the Saturday, it gives them an out. Yeah. You know, and if I don't offer the Saturday, then they kind of have to wrap their mind around, okay, I just got to get this, I got to figure this out, I got to get this done and come back. I, on I would check the thing. language first and then as a last resort, you know, carve out some time on some of the Saturdays or something like that. Maybe extra early in the morning or something like that. Who knows? Anyone else have any questions? On the, oh, John? Good, good, good. Who's, where's that coming from? John Radio. Oh, thank you, sir. Oh, Raj. What's yeah, going on? Hi. Mr. Zurich. <laughs> no, Zermatt, I'm sorry. Zermatt. Close. Where's your, um, where's your son go to dental school? Moldova. Moldova. Do you guys know where the country of Moldova is? It's by Ukraine and Romania. I Romania, correct? right in the yeah. middle of those two. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, yeah. and if you go to dental school in Moldova, you can come back to California, take the board, and practice right away. That's Very a, interesting. That's it, a blessing, and it's at uh, like one tenth of the cost. Yeah, yeah, it's a little less expensive. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, what we do on Saturdays is we do have a lot of restoratives on um, and hygiene at the yeah. same time. We do try to get.
two, three doctors, uh, four doctors working on that day if we can. Yeah. So all the doctors are there, and we do have one doctor. Right here. She does most of the exams that day and pass them on to the associates. So let me see if you can hold your fingers up. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, but, but it's a great thing. Uh, but, but, but Raj, you know the theory. The theory is, is they won't take off work for hygiene and they will, will take off work for restorative care. So you want to make sure they get in for hygiene first. So you're theoretically losing money by doing restorative on Saturday, if you do the math. Because in the time they do one $1,000 crown, they could check three or four patients at $4,000 to $3,000. That's the theory. I have three, four columns of hygiene on Saturday, yeah. and I don't need four doctors to do that. Yeah. Yeah, I have one doctor doing that. Yeah. Yeah, the rest of them are doing restorative. Yeah, yeah. So I agree. I, I know I understand the theory. Yeah. But where am I losing exams at? Because you could have had the chairs that are being used by the doctors used for cleanings. And those chairs are, right? That's, right, I know, I agree with it. Yeah. But uh, are we saying that uh, we can put all 12 chairs into hygiene and we can fill them up? 12 chairs? Yeah. Oh, of course. We, I have guys that fill up uh, 25 chairs. Okay. You just say yes. Yes. Offer them. Let's so, do it. Yeah, the more we check, the more you find. It's counterintuitive. And doctors always want to do the work, but by doing the work to get the $1,000 or the $2,000 worth of a crown, they're not checking three or four patients who would have also been, in your case, 700 bucks each. So Got that's it. where you lose the money. Got it. So, and, and that goes back to what Brandon was talking about. It assumes you can get them to come back uh, Tuesday at 2 o'clock or stay later on the Saturday. So a lot of guys do stay later on Saturdays. There's inevitable openings anyway on hygiene on Saturdays. If you got those, then do it, the, do it on that Saturday, but don't sacrifice hygiene for pre, pre-booked, restored. It's, it's, you're doing great, and I'm so proud of you and thankful, but you would do better by not doing that. Got it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Raj. Anybody else with jokes or anything? All right. Thank you so very much. Appreciate you taking the time to get out here. To our speakers... My Lord, I cannot believe the work those guys put into this stuff. Because you know, you know why, right? I can't say they give a shit, can I? Can I say they give a shit? They care about you guys, man. I'm telling you. They care about you guys. And it shows. These guys did phenomenal stuff. So, so thankful. Thank you, guys.